Hello and welcome to episode 29 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, October 4th, 2020, and I'm Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, and I'm here with my dad through Zoom. And yesterday was actually my dad's birthday. Yeah, don't tell him how old I am. I don't want anybody to know because when you get old, people are ready to put you in the wheelbarrow. So I don't want you to tell them how old I am. Well, I know you're not ready to leave the planet, so. Well, God knows I'm ready because you have to be ready, but I hope it doesn't happen for a while. And I hope I keep my marbles a little bit longer. Well, I, I hope so too. I think so far you've still got a lot of marbles, so that's a good thing. All right, it so is. today, Today, we are going to be talking about Fourth Ward, and uh, I noticed you titled it Fourth Ward, A Preservation Turning Point, and I do think that's really true, so this is a, a really interesting story to, to tell, so I will let you take it away. Well, you know, that might, this might become a little bit academic, but um, I do think it's it's really important important to know that uh, this was really my first major effort in preservation and I'll try to make the point that um, preservation is so important to the cultural narrative and learning history and anyway let's let's make the point I'm going to give a little map later but the wards were created in the 1860s and first ward is bounded by on the south by west trade street and on the east by north tryon street and on the west by the southern railroad track and on the north by the seaboard coastline railroad track so that's 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 what it is. So I'll show you a map later. And I'm going to start out talking. You know, we had a, a lot of podcasts about urban renewal. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the real modern preservation movement in Charlotte Mecklenburg started in the 1970s. And as I mentioned to you before, it was largely a matter of a reaction against urban renewal. And in the 1960s, and you'll see the year down at the bottom is 1961, Fourth Ward was regarded as a prime target for urban renewal. The whole notion was they were going to do the same thing with Fourth Ward that they did with Brooklyn or Second Ward, and they were gonna do with First Ward. In other words, it was gonna be total clearance. For the most part, when everybody thought about Fourth Ward in the early 1960s, especially when you went back on streets like Church Street and Poplar Street and Pine Street, it was thought to be truly a decrepit slum. Now, these two photographs that are on the screen here of houses, they appeared in the newspaper on the 1st of November, 1961. And they look downright awful. They look worse than I do. And I'm still <laughs> not going to tell you how old I am. But look what look look what that was said in the newspaper. Um, in the last twenty years, Fourth Ward, the Fourth Ward area, has taken a tumble from being a still fine residential neighborhood to a borderline case. Some think it may already be too late to save the section. Fourth Ward is an example of what can happen for different causes, perhaps in other 
close in residential areas. Now, one thing that the leaders of Charlotte were really afraid of in the early 1960s was that there was going to be creeping deterioration, that slums were going to spread like slime across the landscape. And therefore, something had to be done about Fourth Ward. And the, the idea was, what exactly should they do about it? Now, you remember that one of the names that was used for Second Ward, and by 1961, Vernon Sawyer, who you remember was the director of Urban Renewal, man, he was doing his thing in Second Ward, which, as you well know, they also called Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So in the newspaper, one of the uh, leaders of the community said, it looked like Fourth Ward was going to become another Brooklyn. It was going to have the same thing done with it that was done in First Ward and Second Ward, otherwise known as Brooklyn. And that idea really stays at the front burner throughout the 1960s. And it says in this, this leader said in 10 years, that means 1971 and 1961, in 10 years, if nothing is done, it will be another Brooklyn attorney, John Warren says. So that was what was thought about. And the only thing in my judgment that kept Fourth Ward from being totally bulldozed was because the city was spending all its time dealing with Brooklyn and with First Ward. They were so preoccupied with the second ward and first ward areas that literally fourth ward largely survived because of neglect. Now you remember we had two podcasts. In fact, I think we had like four podcasts, <laughs> a nauseating number of podcasts <laughs> on mid-century modern. Right. And you might remember that one of the big advocates for mid-century modernism, and in fact, I said he was the leading local advocate for mid-century modernism, was A.G. O'Dell, Jr. Well, in August of 1965, Gulli O'Dell, his architectural firm, released a master plan for the center city. Now, it was not officially adopted until 1966, but it was released to the public in 1965. Now, the drawings that I've got here are not a fourth ward. They're, they tend to be of first ward and second ward. But let me tell you, this gets a little bit esoteric and I'm not gonna get into it too much, but there was an idea that really the best way to have a wonderful center city was to have high rise buildings separated by green spaces. And that was going to create what was called the radiant city, open to the sunshine. Everybody was gonna go out and play horseshoes Everybody was going to run around with their children. It was just going to be, if you will, a wonderful place. Now, as far as what this downtown master plan got a tremendous amount of publicity, and A.G. O'Dell did all this blah, 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 blah talking <laughs> about it. Here's what it recommended for Fourth Ward. I've got it written over here. The 1966 downtown master plan envisions the area known as Fourth Ward as the site of high rise housing. In other words, Gulli O'Dell recommended that everything 
certainly in the interior of Fourth Ward. The old residential areas on Poplar, Church, Pine, everything should be bulldozed. And by the way, there was one, here's what, here's what he thought it ought to look like. That's what Fourth Ward ought to, just get rid of it, man. Now, you know. What's that a picture of? That's First Ward. That's First but, Ward, okay. But so. that, that was the image. Right. That was what they were going to do. They're going to do the same thing they were doing to First Ward. Clear it. Get rid of it. And the idea was really, you know, they were, they, even though there are many things about mid-century modern that I like, it was arrogant. You know, revolutionaries are dangerous people because they think they're going to make the world perfect. And it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's like Toto and all the rest. It's like they're going to totally redo everything. And the idea of, of trying to have any kind of tradition or continuity or anything that binds us one generation to another, just get rid of it. Now, here is Fourth Ward. Fourth Ward is, is this is the area I'm talking about. Here's North Tryon Street going up and down. See, North Tryon Street going up mm -hmm. and down. Here's West Trade Street going over here. Here's here's the railroad track. See the railroad track over here? Yeah. This shaded area is basically what we're talking about. The area okay. to the northwest of the square. And one of the things that was seriously thought about was putting a huge development up there that would have a convention center, would have a hotel, and you just got rid of everything. That didn't happen, but because they didn't get liquor by the drink early enough. But that was what was being a thought. Now there's one vestige of what A.G. Odell wanted. One thing was done that A.G. Odell thought all of Fourth Ward ought to look like. That was put up by the housing authority. It's still there. It was built in 1967. And it's called Edwin Towers. Now, can you imagine Fourth Ward being filled all with that? I mean, that's what the idea was. And everybody would have a wonderful view of the center city. They'd be able to go out and have a garden. They'd be able to play horseshoes. They'd be able to have badminton courts. Ba 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 ba. Okay. Well, that was the notion. Now, you know, here there's old Vernon Sawyer and there's Gulli O'Dell up there at the top. There's Gulli O'Dell sitting there by his, by you know, by by his geometric shape. Mm -hmm. The triangles. Right. Remember, uh, you remember Westminster Fuller loved triangles. Mm -hmm. Remember how you like triangles? And there's good old Vernon Sawyer down below. And in 1971, by 1971, they'd pretty much done what they wanted to do with First Ward and with Second Ward. So they're getting ready to say, well, now what are we going to do with Fourth Ward? Now, you know, we've got these plans, we've got Edwin Towers. Problem is, we're not getting any other private investors to go in there. What are we going to do? Well, they brought some consultants in. God knows, you know what? You know, consultants are paid a lot of money because they're strangers and people, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. So people are more likely to listen to strangers than they are to people in their own hometown. So they brought these consultants in and they looked at those areas that they thought were really good chances for urban renewal ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> okay. and the consulting firm that gave its report in january of 1971 i mean vernon sawyer sitting over there just you know i'm sure his water it is mouth water you know boy he just he can smell the fumes coming out of that bulldozer the consulting firm found that 88% of the 
of the structures in the Fourth Ward area northwest of downtown have deficiencies and 55% are bad enough to warrant clearance. Well, they've gone down to 55%, but still they're wanting to go in there and just tear it to pieces. And, and th that was the thinking, that was the thinking. You know, they looked at houses like this, they knew nothing about its history. They didn't care anything about its history. They'd never done any research on their history. The only thing that this house was, was a dump. It was an old beat up dump. It was in the way. It was in the way. And you know what you do with things in the way. You get, a big, are... piece, you get a big pea shooter out and go, <laughs> you whap it down, right? So that was the notion. And there were city leaders that were just, you know, wanting to get going. Let's get going. Let's get it cleaned up. Let's get it. Oh, what fourth ward is going to be like a, it's going to be like a sore. It's like a, it's like a scab on your arm. You got to get rid of it. When I was a man named Milton Short. Now, Milton Short was a fine man. He was on the city council for years and years and years. And he came out in March of 1971. And I'm not going to read all this, but he at, at the city council meeting, you know, he said, we got to get going on doing this thing. And he was talking about mixing industry with housing. But again, it was a matter of total clearance. Another man, see, the city's going to dust off Odell's master plan. They're going to finally go over there and do it. This was in 1972. This was another big name. No, but you know, we're all forgotten. We're all forgotten. You know, all these Yankees that moved down here, they don't know any of these people. <laughs> and although I love Yankees, my daddy was a Yankee. So don't, don't, don't. I know, me. I was going to say. <laughs> don't think I'm a, don't think I'm anti-Yankee. But the re reality is so many of these people are moving. They don't know these people. They don't know anything what I'm talking about. That's why we're doing this. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. But. Jim Winnington said, I think it is time to promote and advocate the building of high rise apartments in the Fourth Ward area. Councilman James B. Winnington said today, January 1972. He was a he was a funeral. He was a he was a he was in the funeral business. You know, people who are in the funeral business have got good people skills. They've got to have. So a lot of them go into politics. And, you know, he was listened to. So that was the, the whole idea, Mary, Mary, Mary Dana. What are you, what are you going to do with Fourth Ward? You're going to blow it up. Now, it didn't happen. Now, the issue is, why didn't it happen? Well, there, there began to be a change of attitude. And, you know, you think about... Uh, what a difference a change of attitude can make. Some of this I've, I've uh, mentioned before. See, the man on the right in the, in the buff colored jackets, a man named James Stenhouse. Now I knew James Stenhouse, God bless him. He's gone, he's been gone a long time. James Stenhouse was an architect, but he probably did more to sort of advocate that we did have something in Mecklenburg County worth saving. Because the attitude of Jim Whittington and Milton Short and Vernon Sawyer and A.G. O'Dell fundamentally was, we didn't have any history. There wasn't anything worth saving. Certainly nothing like that old dumpy house over there on Ninth Street, that big white thing I showed you. Who would want to do with that? What's What's, What's historic about that? Well, there was a movement for consolidation of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County in the early 1970s. They actually established a Charlotte Mecklenburg Charter Commission to consider about consolidation. Well, it never happened. But they spent a lot of money and a lot of time. And one of the things they had was a committee to deal with what we ought to do with the built or man-made environment. 
what what were the what were the ways that a consolidated government could deal with the man-made environment and jim stenhouse because he was well known as an advocate for local preservation he put together a report with the help of Bob Stipe. Now I've mentioned Robert Stipe before who was at the Institute of Government at Chapel Hill, was very much a preservationist. To put together a report to the Charter Commission to argue against the idea that we didn't have anything of value. Now Stenhouse wasn't really dealing with Fourth Ward, he was dealing with more like old colonial period houses. Mm -hmm. But Robert Stipe got the state to put together a report with Jim Stenhouse's help to present to this charter commission. And the report said, we do have something that said, it says that the local opinion that there is nothing of historic value worth saving left in the county is all wet according to a report that will be presented tomorrow to a charlotte mecklenburg charter commission committee now this was a whole new direction now in addition to saying that we ought to have a appreciation for the fact that we had some history and Bob Stipe was certainly the, Robert Stipe was certainly the principal one for, that would have brought this into the report. They also raised the issue that really this new consolidated government ought to establish an historical commission to survey the area, find out what's out there of historic importance, prepare preservation plans, and recommend priorities and programs. In other words, gov local government ought to get in the business of trying to say, wait a minute, maybe we've got something here of preservation importance. And this was a, this was a really important event because at least another idea was coming on the table. Now you can imagine how Julio Dell felt about this. <clears throat> <laughs> you can imagine how Vernon Sawyer felt about this. Oomph, oomph. But this was being articulated. Now, uh, there was also, even Vernon Sawyer would be sympathetic to this. Um, the year is 1971. There was a realization by 1971 of course, Richard Nixon was president of the United States, but much of that, the previous president, Lyndon Johnson, had created the National Register. There was a realization increasingly by the federal government that, you know, maybe we just went a little bit overboard with this urban renewal stuff. Because remember, it was the, um, it was the, federal government that really funded this st stuff. And look look at the last paragraph here in this part here. And the word out of Washington is, 1971, that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is eager to finance projects that involve preserving old buildings. So you not only had a change of heart in terms of local citizens presenting this report to the Charter Commission, but the federal government began to question, maybe it had gone a little bit overboard in terms of destroying the historic character of the country. And so the worm is beginning to turn. And even Vernon, Vernon Sawyer, you know, he was like a, he was like a greyhound dog chasing a rabbit. I mean, if the federal government, the rabbit was federal money. And if the federal government said, hey, look, you need to think more about historic st stuff, even Vernon Sawyer, urban redevelopment director, is going to take note of that. Now, 
I, I mentioned this all before, and I'm not going to go into it again, except I will mention one thing. I got involved with Ed Brazell because I was picking up on this whole notion that was coming, coming to the fore. And in June of 1973, there was this program sponsored by the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where Ed Prezell and I, who were professors, gave this slide program about the importance of the fact that the urban center needed its past. And also UNCC brought this leading preservationist from Pittsburgh named Arthur Ziegler to say, look at the last paragraph down at the bottom, but, but Arthur Ziegler, Arthur Ziegler added, the experiences of other cities in trying to renovate older neighborhoods might open the minds of Charlotte planners to alternative methods of urban renewal. In other words, don't just go in there with these blooming bulldozers. You know, caterpillar gone malignant, right? You know, crank them up. Let's take a different approach. Now, how many people came to your slideshow? Huh? How many people came to your slideshow? Oh, well, they didn't. They came to the conference and we were in. I'd say there are probably 200 people there. Okay. And they were influential people. So a new idea is being planted. Okay. Now, also, there was a citizens group. Uh, Former uh, Charlotte Mayor Patsy Kinsey, I mean, she wasn't mayor then. Patsy Kinsey was one of the members of this group called Citizens for Preservation. And they really got involved with Fourth Ward. They really wanted to promote Fourth Ward. And this was a grassroots group. And uh, you can't see the date there, but it was January 1973. They gave a program called Stained Glass and Gingerbread, and they basically highlighted these rundown dumps in Fourth Ward and said, instead of being rundown dumps, they were hidden jewels. And they also advocated that if necessary, we could move other endangered Victorian era houses to Fourth Ward to create a new image. Now, the last person I'm going to mention that was a critical one was a man named Reese Cleghorn. Now, Reese Cleghorn is somewhat of a giant in journalism. He came from Atlanta to Charlotte in April 1971 to be editor of the editorial page. And he was the one who really got Jack Claiborne, whom I've mentioned before, to start writing mm -hmm. articles about preservation. Because Reese Cleghorn believed that the newspaper should try to make good things happen. And Reese Cleghorn knew all about urban renewal, having come from Atlanta. And he knew what had happened to Second Ward and First Ward. And he had a lot of questions about it. And now that preservation was seen as a different method of neighborhood renewal, he began to be very, very much an advocate. So it was a, it was like a perfect storm. A. G. O'Dell was losing the battle. Uh, Vernon Sawyer was losing the battle. Planners began to think about another way to actually re revive a, a, a neighborhood. Now. By the way, you've been talking for almost 30 minutes. I well, think. that's okay, because okay. that's okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna do this part, we can do the next part next week. We'll do it okay. next week. <laughs> I'll give them a little tour of Fourth Ward. With Sel but for me, Dave, it's really important. I agree, uh, I just wanted to let you know. God, God bless you, God bless you. Because you always Dave, tell me, why didn't you tell side. me? You're on my side, you're absolutely <laughs> now. The, the, the article on the right-hand side of the screen is from J June 6, 1973. And it says, you know, with an eye toward preserving some of the past, the city council and the county commission have created the Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Properties Commission. Now, this was a really huge event because 
everything up until that time had been private. And even though I'm a great advocate of private preservation, it's wonderful. There's nothing like having an institution that's funded by tax dollars, that's gonna be around and it's gonna stay. And the article on the left is October 10th, 1974, which announces, announces that this history professor who has especially in Russian history, and God knows that was a burden that I carried, Jesus. Anyway, has been named the director. So I became the director in 1974. Well, you know me well enough, Mary, Mary Dana. I'm kind of like a, you know, put a bit in my mouth and I'm, I'm running. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to. But I knew that one of the things that we were supposed to do was we were supposed to find out what's out there. Now, and the planners were, they were also, you know, they were coming on board. You know, the Citizen for Preservation group was, was advocating the planners. Planners dream, dreamers plan about the future of Fourth Ward. It represents the city's last chance to preserve a neighborhood of the late 19th century vintage for a resident to use, and the chance is slipping away. Can you imagine, remember what, Remember what Jim Whittington was saying? Milton Short was saying, tear it down. A.G. O'Dell was saying, tear it down. Vernon Sawyer was saying, tear it down. By 1974, even the planners are coming around to the idea, let's see what we can do. Now, I knew one thing that we were supposed to do on the Properties Commission was to do a, a survey. Did you, did you know all those guys? Like you did, right? All those, the urban renewal guys. Did they ever talk to you or did y'all speak to each other? I got to know them after I became director of the Historic Landmarks Commission or the Historic Properties Commission as it was originally known. What was their attitude towards you and the well, Properties Commission? Well, you can commission? imagine. They thought I was nuts. <laughs> they thought so, I had noodles between the ears. I mean, they literally were dumbfounded. Why in the world do you want to do this? Because, yeah, that's what You know, they had, I, I tell you, you know, I, I think mid-century modernism's great, but it is arrogant as hell. I mean, they thought they literally knew the truth. They were going to reshape the world. And they and were that, trying to get you on board. Did they try to? Oh, they had. They 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 they, they gave up on that. They <laughs> they really thought that I was nuts. I mean, I mean, I mean, what are you talking about? You know, no. Who's ever going? Whoever's going to want to live in Fourth Ward? Those trains are too close. Is that what they said? Okay, that's. Oh yeah. What are you going to do with those? Well, here we go. No, oh, wait, what'd you say to the last slide? I, I interrupted you while you were. Well, that just shows Jim Vasif was one of the people that we hired to do our survey. So we did mm -hmm. a comprehensive survey to identify what's out there. The first really critical database of historic resources all throughout the county. And, you know, it's over there in the file drawers of the Historic uh, Landmarks Commission to this day. On Randolph well, Road, right? No, Randolph Road. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some people. Now, there's no doubt. Now, there's that dumpy old crummy boopy house, right? Yeah. There's, there's that house. Well, this is Newcomb Berry Hill house. I guess one of my roles was to tell the story. I do historical research and I, I'm going to give y'all a tour of Fourth Ward next week and I'll go into this in a lot more detail. But I tell the story. It wasn't just, see, see to somebody like Odell, they didn't even care about the history. They didn't know how, who built it. They didn't know what it said about the nature of the town. Or they who lived that. there, who I lived would, there. I wrote all these articles for the newspaper. I was a crazy man talking about when these things were done. Then there were real, real heroes. Catherine Barnhart Browning, she was Catherine Barnhart then. She was president of the Junior League. Now the Junior League was really a very influential group at that time. And 
she really stuck her neck out because it was unlike anything the junior league had ever been done before. They like to basically feed poor people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with feeding poor people. I don't think there's anything wrong with feeding anybody unless you're fat. No, dad. Well, <laughs> well, well, I'm fat. Well, anyway, uh, slightly, okay. maybe I'm slightly obese. Anyway, the, 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 they, she stuck her neck out because the junior league bought this house. They bought what we now knew as the Newcomb Bear Hill house. When you do research on a house, one of the first things you do is put a name on it. Then it's not just that old house. It's the Newcomb Bear Hill. Kind of humanizes it, right? It humanizes it. And I'll have a lot to say. And they began to raise money like this woman July 1976 coming. She's gone in the house because they had a sale in the house. They gathered all kinds of stuff like you do at the Sleepy Poet. They gathered, gathered all this stuff, put it in there and sold it to raise money to renovate the house. And they eventually sold the house with the Preservation Covenant the deed. And then there were urban pioneers. Now, one of the urban pioneers people who were willing to go down there and do a whole new way of life. And one of them was Dennis Rash. And Dennis Rash, uh, he, 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 he didn't move in the Bear Hill house. He lived close by. But Dennis Rash was a UNCC official, later worked for Hugh McCall at what was in NCNB, now Bank of America. And he was one who moved into that neighborhood. And so the neighborhood began to take on a whole different character. You know, now here is, here is the, 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 the Star Mill store. Now, I'll talk about this during our tour. But there, it was, a, it was a, look what it looked like on the left. It, this is what it looked like in 1975. The right is what it looked like 1982. And that's now Alexander Michaels. That's the place you go eat. Mm -hmm. People go in there and eat. Right. And so they, the house was saved first. The house what? was saved. The house was saved first. And then later on. the That's right. And it, was, it was a momentum. Again, part of my contribution was to tell the story, to tell the story tell what it was and that'll be on our tour next week and of course what we ended up with was something that basically was over here on the right you see it, it didn't get bulldozed it became a very very diverse and interesting neighborhood this is somebody going having a birthday party in a house that we'll see next week the Liddell McNinch house they came in and improved the streets. There's the Overcarch house, another Victorian house that'll be on our tour next week. So it, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. It was a big success. It all had to do with a different approach. Now, how long have we been talking? Oh, I think about 40 minutes. Hold on my phone. Yeah, about 40 minutes. Well, you know, in my mind, think about the difference that this makes. Think about if all of Fourth Ward looked like Edwin Towers. I would invite you, and I'm not damning uh, Edwin Towers. JNP Jr., by the way, is the architect for Edwin Towers. But can you imagine how boring that would be? And of yeah. course, more, more than that, as you'll see next week, you now have right in the center city a wonderful place to teach history. Because as I have said before, these are artifacts. Now, dear people, uh, you know, I go back to the, to the very beginning of this thing and for heaven's sake, folks, <laughs> help us out. Help us out. Keep preservation going. You watch these podcasts. Come on, folks. $2.08 per month. 
$25 a year. You know, I had two people last week that sent money in. Two people. I tell you, it's amazing. It's amazing how difficult it is to convince people. To, this is an important movement. Go on and become a supporter. You like Fourth Ward? You like going to Alexander Michaels? Be a supporter. PreserveMech.org forward slash donate and make a contribution. And we'll have a good tour of uh, Fourth Ward next week. Okay, great. Well, Dad, thanks for sharing your stories. You're still a storyteller, even after all this time. So, the doodles are still there. That's right. Still, still. People, a lot of people still think you're nuts, though. That's okay. They do. They do. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for being with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time uh, for our tour of Fourth Ward. Okay. Bye. Bye, Dad. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>